Well, last Sunday, we had our first Sunday of Advent, uh, and so we lit our first Advent candle. Uh, Advent candles, if you recall from last week, are, are like a countdown for Christmas. Not only do they build our anticipation for Christmas, uh, but they, each candle gives us some specific reminders of what Christmas is really all about. And so last week, we lit the prophet's candle, or, or the candle of hope. Uh, and this candle reminds us of all of God's promises throughout the Bible. Uh, in fact, last week, we started in Genesis, and we worked all our way through uh, to Revelation. And through it all, we saw God's continued and building promise of hope. Hope that would one day be fulfilled in a little baby who was born and laid in a manger. Jesus Christ, God's own son, would be born as a human being. He would live a sinless life and, and through his death and resurrection would provide the gift of eternal life to every person on earth. Even though man had rebelled against God and in doing so had brought death and destruction into God's good creation, uh, Jesus Christ would put an end to sin and all of its consequences. And he would reign forever as the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Now, of course, not all of these promises in the Bible have yet been fulfilled. Many have been, but there are still a few more to go. And so, with that same hope of, of Adam and Eve, uh, of King David, of all the prophets of old, uh, just as they eagerly look forward to and, and hoped for the Messiah to come the first time, we too look forward to and hope for the Messiah to return for the second time, uh, for Christ's second return when he comes to make all things right again. You know, what, a, what a glorious hope we have in Jesus Christ. Now, today we lit the second Advent candle, which Darian and Michaela told us is the Bethlehem candle or the candle of faith. And faith quite naturally goes hand in hand with hope. Uh, Hebrews 11 reminds us. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Or to put it another way, hope is our eager expectation for future realities, but faith is what gives us confidence in that hope, right? Faith is the assurance that our hope isn't just, you know, wishful thinking, but rather it's based on something solid and trustworthy. And so this morning, I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about faith, right? What gives us the assurance that what we hope for will actually become reality? You know, is that perfect world that we talked about last week, you know, where, where you live with God forever, with, with no crying, no pain, no death, you know, is that just delusional, wishful thinking? Or do we actually have good reason to believe that, to be reality, to, to hope for that, right? What is the basis of our faith? Well, that's what we want to look at this morning. But before we do that, let's pause here and pray and ask God to teach us something from his word this morning. Dear God, we thank you for uh, the season of Advent and for these, these candles that remind us of, of so many aspects of, of your character, God. Uh, we thank you uh, for sending your son, Jesus, giving us that hope. And, and I pray that today, as we look at your word, uh, we would have ever-increased faith in you and faith in that hope, that we would know without a, a shadow of a doubt that you are going to return and you're going to do away with sin and uh, make all things right again. And we have an eternity to look forward to in your presence. God, we thank you so much for all these things. We pray that you continue to teach us things as we look at your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start today by looking at the faith of Mary. Now, of course, there are countless other examples that we could look at uh, in the Bible, but it is Christmas after all, and Mary is actually a tremendous example of what faith looks like, um, especially given her situation. So if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to be looking in Acts, or not in Acts, we've been so stuck in Acts for the last uh, year, uh, but we'll look in Luke chapter 1 this morning, starting at verse 26, and we'll see what we can learn about faith from Mary. So verse 26 begins like this. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Now, just uh, to interrupt really quickly here, uh, one of the, the key things that we should make note of in these verses is that Mary is a virgin who's engaged to be married. Now, of course, this is significant for a number of reasons, but I want to point it out today just because it reveals to us that Mary is still very young. Right? In those days, in the Israelite culture, most marriages were arranged marriages, and quite often uh, these arrangements were made during the girl's early teenage years. Uh, some would be arranged as early as when the girl is about 12 years 
years old. Um, most scholars would probably guess that, you know, 13 to 15 is probably about the time that, that Mary would have had her engagement. Um, and the, the Bible never specifically gives us these dates, uh, but based on the, the typical cultural practices, that's kind of what we put it um, at. And so, of course, this really makes Mary's response to everything that's about to happen just really amazing. And, and, and you'll see what I mean as we go along. So let's just keep reading as the angel Gabriel makes his visit to Mary. Uh, verse 28, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And I'll pause here again, because this is an amazing message. I know we've heard it many, many times, but just think of the, the incredibleness of this message. You know, as we talked about last week, all of Israel had waited literally hundreds of years for their Messiah to arrive. Uh, that, that promised Messiah who would crush Satan's head and do away with sin forever. The one who would reign on the throne of David forever and ever and ever. And so for Mary now to be told that, that she's going to have a son and that son would be that Messiah, that is incredible. In fact, for Mary, it was, it was almost unbelievable. Uh, we read in verse 34, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. In essence, the angel told Mary that God was about to do uh, an amazing miracle. He was going to do the impossible. Uh, and a, a miracle would happen within her. She would have a, a baby simply through the power of God. And as proof of God's ability to do the impossible, Mary could just look to her relative Elizabeth, who had just experienced a miracle herself. Uh, as Luke tells us a little bit earlier on in this chapter, uh, Elizabeth was quite old and had been unable to have children up until this point. But yet here she was, now six months pregnant. I mean, God can do anything. And then to punctuate what he had just said, the angel concludes with this definitive statement. He says, for the word of God will never fail. And it's in that, that concluding statement that Mary is given the basis for her faith, the unwavering and unfailable word of God. You know, her, her anticipation of, of having a baby while still a virgin it was not, you know, a delusion or wishful thinking. Uh, the hope that her baby could be the long-awaited Messiah, that was not a, a baseless fantasy. No, Mary could have faith that her hopes were all well-founded because God had said so. As the angel had reminded her, the word of God will never fail. The unwavering, unfailable word of God will never fail. Uh, her, her relative Elizabeth was, was living proof that that was so. Whatever God says he will do, that thing will happen. God has both the will and the way to make it happen. He knows all things. He can do all things. And so it will happen. The word of God will never fail. You know, we were reminded last week, uh, as we talked about the prophecies in the Bible, that, that a quarter of the Bible, more than a quarter of the Bible, is God saying, here's what I'm going to do. And then as you read a little further on, God does exactly that. Uh, again, proof that the word of God will never fail. Uh, I saw a list this week as I was doing some reading on this, uh, a list of 351 prophecies about the Messiah that are through the Old Testament. But then alongside each one of those was a passage from the New Testament that showed how Jesus Christ fulfilled every single one of them. Again, more faith or more evidence that the word of God will never fail. You know, no matter how, how crazy it sounds or how unlikely it seems, if God has said something to be true, you can count on it. You know, and this principle applies as much to us as it did to Mary. Now, of course, Mary had a, a pretty unique situation where she really would have good cause to wonder how in the world will this ever happen? But, you know, I think we all have our, our seemingly impossible situations that we have to wrestle with. You know, maybe you wrestle with questions like, you know, how in the world will God ever fix this broken relationship? Or, or how in the world will God ever forgive me after what I've done? Or, or how in the world can I ever gain victory over this persistent sin in my life? 
Or how in the world will God ever take this awful situation and use it for good? Or how in the world will God ever, you know, fill in the blank with whatever it is that you're wrestling with right now? But can I just encourage you this morning that the word of God will never fail. Now, if God has said something in his word, you can be absolutely confident that God will bring it to pass, no matter how unlikely or how impossible it seems. You know, what seemed completely impossible in Mary's mind was totally possible with God. In fact, from God's omniscient perspective, it had, it had already happened, really, right? God, God knew how everything was going to play out from the, before the beginning of time. And, and so God knew that this was going to happen. And God has that same perspective in your situation as well. You know, if God said something, it's like it's already done. We just have to trust that God can work out his plan and his will according to, to his way. And I know, I know that's tough to do because we don't have that same omniscient perspective. We don't see how this is all going to turn out. But we can trust that God has seen it. He knows how it's all going to play out. And the word of God will never fail. We just need to learn to trust and believe that. And Mary did. You know, this is, this is maybe the, the most amazing thing uh, of Mary's story. It's in verse 38. After hearing all these incredible things that the angel Gabriel had just said to her, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Now, can you believe that response? And again, I'll remind you that this is from a young teenage girl. She has just been told that she's going to have a child out of wedlock, something that was totally scandalous in that time, in that culture. And because of what the, the angel had just told her, she would have a very good chance of living the rest of her life, you know, as an outcast, to say the least. You know, on top of that, she had no idea how Joseph would react to this, how her family would react to this. I mean, technically, uh, if she was found to be with child, Joseph had every right to, to have her stoned for committing adultery, right? This truly was a life-altering announcement that the angel had brought to her. And what does she say? I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. You know, what an, a, an astonishing statement of faith. What, what a, a mark of incredible spiritual maturity. You know, and this is from a, a 13 to 16 year old. I, I can't speak for you, but I know that when I was 13 to 16 year old, I did not have anywhere near that type of spiritual maturity. I, even now, you know, if God were to, to give me some life altering assignment that would upend my future life that I'd planned for myself and set me as an outcast amongst my family and friends and community, I'm not sure I would embrace the will of God as quickly as Mary did. I'd like to think so, but I'm not so sure. But Mary didn't even hesitate, right? She had the kind of confidence in God that enabled her to just fully and immediately submit to his will, even when she didn't understand how it would all work out. And I guess, I guess that's the definition of faith, as we read in Hebrews 11, 1 earlier. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. No, Mary had no idea how this was all going to play out. She didn't know how her parents were going to react or how Joseph would react. She certainly didn't understand how she was going to have a baby while still a virgin. But she believed God. And her faith in God allowed her to have the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And I think that's just a great reminder for us today. You know, we can have that same kind of confidence in God no matter what our situation. Because the reality is, all of us place our faith in something, right? The only question is who or what do we place our, our faith in? You know, I, and I think going through a crisis really reveals where we place our faith. You know, as North Americans, I think our typical default tendency is, is to put a lot of faith in our economy. That's just kind of the, the world in which we live, right? We, we gain our confidence from our ability to provide for ourselves, right? We, we feel hopeful when, when the markets are up and when there's savings in the account and, and when the paycheck comes every two weeks, right? We, we feel good about life. We, we feel a sense of, of hope and peace and, and hope for the future so long as the money's in place, right? But what happens when the, uh, the economy falls apart, right? When, when the markets crash or, or our retirement funds disappear overnight, when the paycheck stops, what then? right? Do we lose our joy? Do we lose our peace? Do we lose our hope? And if so, well, maybe our faith is in the wrong thing. Uh, or how about another example? I think a lot of us uh, put a lot of faith in the medical community. Um, we're trusting that our doctors and our nurses and our, our chiropractors and our pharmacists and all those folks will help keep us healthy and well. We're trusting that they can cure our, our, our sicknesses and, and treat our broken bodies, right? From the, the birth of our children to, to caring for us in our old age, right? We, we put a lot of faith in the medical community to keep us healthy and well. 
But you know, for all the advances in medicine and all the wonderful facilities and the hard work of all these, these uh, wonderful professionals, people still get sick. People still suffer. People still die. You know, medicine and doctors are, are wonderful gifts from God, but they're not our ultimate source of peace and hope. You know, and I could give you probably several more examples uh, of misplaced faith. You know, perhaps we, we trust in our governments to save us from disaster. Or we trust our families to be there for us when we need them most. Uh, maybe we trust our own abilities, our own wisdom, or our own strength. But all of these things can be taken away from us in a flash. All of these things can let us down. There's a, there's a kid's song that we sing out at camp sometimes. We've done it once or twice up here. Uh, it says, the man in the world, he's going to let you down. But my Jesus never fail. All right, the president... He's going to let you down. The prime minister, too. He's going to let you down. Your parents, your pastor, your money, your boss, your doctors, the man in the world, he's going to let you down. But my Jesus never fail. You know, and that's the bottom line of it. My Jesus never fails. Right? God has never made a promise that he hasn't kept. He's never failed to keep his word. If he says something will happen, it will happen. You know, if God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he will never leave you or forsake you. If God says, I will make all things work together for good, he will make all things work together for good. God always keeps his promises, even in those times when we have no idea how he's going to do it. We can put our faith in God. We can believe that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. In fact, God requires such faith. Uh, Hebrews 11.6 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, faith is a requirement for us to please God. It's a choice that we have to make. Now, of course, we won't ever be told by an angel that, you know, we're going to miraculously give birth to the Son of God, but all of us face situations where we need to choose to trust God, to put our faith in God. We need to choose to believe his promises and to trust his character. And really, why wouldn't we, right? I mean, who else would we trust more than our God? Our governments? Our, our stockbrokers? Our, ourselves? Is anyone more, more wise or more powerful than our God? Is anyone more loving or good or generous as our God? You know, we only need to look to the cross and then to the empty tomb to see how good and how powerful our God is. You know, Romans 8, 31 reminds us, What should we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, that's got to be worth a, a hallelujah or an amen or something, right? I know we're not usually that kind of church. But, you know, our faith in God is not a blind faith, right? It's not a, a cross your fingers and hope for the best kind of a faith. Amen. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Our faith in God is a confident trust in a powerful, loving God and in his word. Our faith is in a God who is willing to die for us and who had the power to rise again from the grave. Now, it's true. We don't know how all the, the difficulties in our life are going to turn out. You know, we don't know what's going to happen to the economy or to our jobs or, or, or to the schools or to our loved ones. You know, there's all kinds of unknowns. But we know that there's a God who's sovereign over all. We know that God loves each one of us more than we can even comprehend. 
And we know that that God works all things together for good for those who love him. God has clearly said so in his word. So rather than fearing the things that we don't know, let's put our faith in the one that we do know. Let's put our faith in the one who saw all of history before time began. Let's put our faith in the one who knows exactly how he's going to rescue us or get us through whatever situation that we're going through right now. Let's put our faith in the one who is still in control and will use every situation for his glory and for our ultimate good. Let's put our faith in God. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much for the example of Mary. Uh, It's incredible to think how quickly she just submitted herself fully to the word of God. God, may we mimic that in our lives. God, we may not be asked to to do such uh, incredible things as Mary was presented with, but God, we face a lot of our own situations. Every moment we have the choice whether we're going to trust you, to trust in your goodness, to trust in your power, to trust in your love for each one of us. And God, I pray that we would make that choice. May we choose to put our faith in you and not all these other things that that, uh, have such great promises for us, Uh, but we know that those are all, all false. All those things will let us down, but you, God, never will. God, you are You are God from eternity to eternity. You are God. And we pray that we would, each one of us, put our trust in you. God, we thank you so much for this encouragement. We pray that you would remind us of these things as we go through those difficult moments in this week to come. Bring these things back to our mind so that we can be reminded to put our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.